This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. I mean, we have done jujitsu before. Yeah, no, I was I was commenting to the team before that even that I, I feel like we've choked each other from further distances than it feels like we are right now. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, for, for background, we both did these scans for uh, this research project that, that we have at Meta called Kodak Avatars. And the idea is that instead of actually, instead of our avatars being cartoony, um, and instead of actually transmitting a video, what it does is we've sort of scanned ourselves and a lot of different expressions, and we've built a computer model of sort of each of our faces and, and bodies and um, the different expressions that we make and collapse that into a, a codec that then when you have the headset on your head, it can, it, it sees your face, it sees your expression, and it can basically send um, an encoded version of what you're supposed to look like over the wire. So, um, so in addition to being photorealistic, it's also actually much more bandwidth efficient than transmitting a, a full video or especially a 3d immersive video of, of a whole scene like this eyes are, are a huge part of it yeah i mean there's all the studies that most of communication even when people are speaking is not actually the words that they're saying right it's it's kind of the expression and, and, and all that so and we try to capture that with the kind of classical um expressive avatar system that we have that's the kind of more cartoon designed one you can you can kind of put those kind of expressions on those faces as well but there, there's obviously a certain realism that comes with delivering kind of this photorealistic experience that um i i don't know i just think it's really magical i mean this gets to kind of the core of what the vision around virtual and augmented reality is of like delivering a sense of presence as if you're there together no matter where you actually are in the world and i mean this this uh experience I think is a good embodiment of that where it's like I mean we're in two completely different states halfway across the country and it just like you know looks like you're just sitting right in front of me it's uh it's pretty wild you know it starts off with a small number of people doing these um very detailed scans right which is this that's the version that you did and that I did and you know before there are a lot of people who who we've done this kind of a scan for, we probably need to kind of over collect expressions um, when we're doing the scanning because we haven't figured out how much we can reduce that down to a really streamlined process mm -hmm. um, and extrapolate from the, the, the scans that have already been done. But you know, the goal, and we have a project that's working on this already, is just to do a very quick scan with your cell phone where you just take your phone, kind of wave it in front of your face for a couple of minutes, um, you know, say a few sentences, make a bunch of expressions, uh, but overall have the whole process just be two to three minutes and then produce something that's of the quality of what we have right now. So I think that that's one of the big challenges that remains. And right now we have the ability to do the scans if you, you know, have hours to sit for one. And with today's technology, I mean, you're using a, a meta headset that exists. It's a product that's kind of for sale now. You can drive these with that. Um, but the production of, of um, these scans in, in a very efficient way is one of the last pieces that we still need to really nail. And then obviously there's all the experiences around it. I mean, right now we're, we're kind of sitting in a dark room, which, um, you know, is, is you know, familiar for for your podcast, but I think part of the the vision for this over time is um, is you know not just having this be like a video call. I mean, that's fine; it's it's cool, or it, it feels like it's immersive. But um, you know, you can you can do a video call on your phone. The thing that you can do in the metaverse that is different from what you can do on a phone is like doing stuff where you're physically there together and and participating in things together. And we could play games like this. Um, we could have meetings uh, like this in, in 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 the future. Once you mix, um, once you get mixed reality and augmented reality, we could have codec avatars like this and go into a meeting and have some people physically there and have some people show up in this photorealistic form, 
uh, superimposed on the on the physical in- environment. And I think that stuff like that is going to be super powerful. So we got to still build out all those kind of applications and the use cases around it. But uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be a pretty wild uh, next few years around this. There's still a bunch of tuning that I think we'll want to do where different people emote to different extents, right? So I think one of the big questions is, you know, like when you smile, how wide is your smile and how wide do you want your smile to be? Um, and I think getting that to be tuned on a per person basis is, um, is going to be one of the things that we, that we're going to need to figure out. Um, you know, it's like, to what extent do you want to give people control over that? Um, you know, some people might try to, you know, might, might prefer a version of themselves that's more emotive in their avatar than their actual faces. You know, so for example, you know, I, I always get a lot of um, critique and, and shit for, um, for, for having like a relatively stiff uh, mm-hmm. expression. But, you know, I mean, I, I, might, I might feel pretty happy, but just make a pretty small smile. So, I mean, maybe, you know, for, for me, I would, I, it's actually, you know, it's like I'd want to have my avatar really be able to better express um, like how I'm feeling than, than what, than, than how I can do physically. So I think that there's a question about how you want to tune that, but, uh, but overall, yeah, I mean, you, we're, we want to start from the baseline of capturing how people actually emote and express themselves. And I mean, I think the, the initial version of this is, has been pretty impressive. And like you said, um, I do think we're, we're kind of beyond the, the uncanny Valley here where it, and it does feel like you, it doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't feel weird or anything like that. I'm curious to see, just because I've never done one of these before. I've never done a podcast as as one of these codec avatars, um, and I'm curious yeah. to see what what how what people think of it because you know one of the issues that we've had in some of the VR and and mixed reality work is it tends to feel a lot more profound when you're in it than the 2D videos capturing the experience. So I think that this one, because it's photorealistic, um, may look kind of as amazing in 2d for people watching it as it, as it feels, I think to be in it. Um, but we've certainly had this, this, um, this issue where a lot of the other things just, it's like, you feel the sense of immersion when you're in it, that that doesn't quite translate to a 2d screen, but I don't know. I'm curious, I'm curious to see, to see what people think. Yeah. I mean, I think we'll probably roll this out progressively over time. So it's not going to be like we roll it out and one day everyone has a codec avatar, uh, we, we want to get more people scanned and into the system, and then we want to start uh, integrating it into each one of our apps, right? Making it so that, you know, I think that for a lot of the work style things, productivity, I think that this is going to make a ton of sense. In a lot of game environments, I mean, this could be fine, but games yeah. tend to have their own style, right? Where you almost want to fit more with the aesthetic style of the, of the game. Um, but I think for doing meetings, and one of the things that we get a lot of feedback on workrooms where you know, people are pretty blown away by the experience and this feeling that you can like be remote, but feel like you're physically there around a table with people. But then you know we, we get some feedback that people have a hard time with the fact that the avatars are so expressive and 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 don't feel you know as as realistic in that environment. So I think something like this um, could make a very big difference for those remote meetings, and especially with Quest Three coming out which is going to be the first mainstream mixed reality product, right? Where you're really taking digital, um, you know, expressions of either a person or, or objects and overlaying them on the physical world. Um, I think the ability to do kind of remote meetings and, and things like that, where you're like, just remote hang sessions with friends. I mean, I, I think that that's going to be very exciting. So yeah, rolling it out over the next, over the next few years, it's not ready to be like a, a, a kind of mainstream product yet. But um, we just want to, we'll keep tuning it and keep getting more scans in there and keep, you know, and kind of rolling it out into more of the features. But yeah, I mean, definitely in the next, in the next um, few years, it will, you'll be seeing a bunch more experiences like this. Well, we got to, we got, we got to get that. It, it, I mean, that's, that's its own <laughs> okay. challenge. Um, and, and part of the question is also, so you have the scan, then it takes a certain amount of compute to go drive that both for the sensors on the headset and, um, and then rendering it. So one of the things that we're working through is what is the level of fidelity that is optimal, right? You could do the full body in, in kind of a codec and that can be quite intensive. But, um, but one of the things that we're, we're thinking about is like, all right, maybe you can kind of stitch a somewhat lower fidelity version of your body 
would still still have the main kind of the major movements. Um, but uh, but it, but your face is really the thing that we have the most resolution on, right? In terms of being able to read and, and express emotions. I mean, like you said, if you move your you know eyebrows like a millimeter, I mean that really changes the expression and what you're you're emoting. Whereas, you know, I mean, moving your your arm like a an inch probably doesn't matter quite as much. So so yeah, so I, I think that we'll we, we do want to get all of that into here, and and that'll be some of the work over the next period as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be it's going to be the first mainstream um, mixed reality device. I mean, obviously, we shipped Quest Pro um, last year, but it was fifteen hundred dollars. Um, and well, part of what I'm super proud of is, you know, we try to innovate not just on pushing the state of the art and delivering new capabilities, but making it so it can be available to everyone. And you know, we, we have this, and it's it's coming out. And it's five hundred dollars, and um, in in some ways, I think the mixed reality is actually better in Quest Three than it was. Um, than, than what we're using right now in Quest Pro. So I mean, I'm really proud of the team for being able to deliver that kind of an innovation and, and get it out. But you know, some of this is just um, the software you tune over time and, and get to be better. Part of it is you put together a product and you figure out what are the bottlenecks in terms of making it a good experience. So we got the resolution for the mixed reality cameras and sensors to be multiple times better in Quest 3. And we just figured that, that that made a very big difference when we saw the experience that we were able to put together for Quest Pro. Um, and part of it is also that you know Qualcomm just came out with their next generation chipset for, for VR and MR, um, that we worked with them on a, on a kind of custom version of it. Um, but that was available this year for Quest 3, and it wasn't available in Quest Pro. So you know, in, in a way, I'm mean, Quest 3, even though it's not you know, the, the Pro product, um, actually has a stronger chipset in it than the Pro line at a third of the cost. So, um, so I'm, I'm really excited to get this in people's hands. It, um, it, it does all the VR stuff that, that Quest 2 and the others have done too. It does it better because the display is better um, and, and the chip is, is better, so you'll get better graphics. Uh, it's 40% thinner, so it's, um, so it's just more comfortable uh, as well. But, but the MR is really the big capability shift. And, and part of what's exciting about the whole space right now is you know this isn't like smartphones where you know companies put out a new smartphone every year and you can almost barely tell the difference between that and the the one the year before it. You now for this each time we put out a new headset it has like a major new capability and and the big one now um is is mixed reality the ability to basically take digital representations of people um or objects and and superimpose them on the world and basically you know I mean there's a, a one version of this is you're going to kind of have these augments or or holograms and, and experiences that you can kind of bring into your living room or a meeting space or an office. Um, another thing that I just think is going to be a much kind of simpler innovation is that there are a lot of VR experiences today that don't need to be fully immersive. And you know, if you're playing a shooter game or you know, you're doing a fitness experience, you know, sometimes people get worried about swinging their arms around. Like, am I going to hit a lamp or, or something? You know, it's... and and you know, am I going to run into something? So having that in mixed reality actually is just a lot more comfortable for people, right? You you kind of still get the immersion and the 3D experience, um, and you can you can have an experience that just wouldn't be possible in the physical world alone. But by being anchored to and being able to see the physical world around you, it's like it just feels so much safer and more secure. And I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy that too. So yeah, I'm really excited to see how people use it. But yeah, Quest Three coming out um, later this fall. It's not that. just the cameras. You basically need to, you need multiple cameras to capture the different angles and and sort of the three dimensional space. And then it's a pretty complex compute problem and AI problem to map that to your perspective, right? Because the cameras aren't exactly where your eyes are. Because no two people's eyes are, are you know, going to be in exactly the same place. You kind of need to 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 get that to 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 line up um, and then do that basically in real time and then generate something that looks that kind of feels natural. Um, and then superimpose whatever digital objects you want to put there. So it's yeah, it's it's a, a very interesting technical challenge, and um, I think we'll continue tuning this for for the years to come as well. But uh, but I'm, I'm pretty excited to to get this out because you know, I think Quest Three is going to be the first device like this with that millions of people are going to get that's mixed reality, and it's only when you have millions of people using something that you start getting 
the whole developer community really starting to experiment and, and build stuff because now there are going to be people who actually use it. Um, so I think we'll get, you know, we got some of that flywheel going with Quest Pro, but I think it'll really get accelerated once Quest 3 gets out there. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this one. Yeah, we've been able to get way further on hand recognition in a shorter period of time than I expected. So that's been pretty cool. I don't know. Did you see the the demo um, experience that we built around um, piano? Like, yeah, the piano, learning to play piano. Yeah. Well, there's what you can do with avatars overall in terms of superimposing digital objects on the physical world. Um, and then there's kind of psychologically, what does having photorealistic do? Um, you know, so I, I think we're moving towards a world where, you know, we're going to have something that looks like normal glasses, where you can just see, you see the physical world, but you will see holograms. And in that world, I think that there are going to be, you know, not too far off, you know, maybe, you know, by the end of this decade, we'll be living in a world where there are kind of as many holograms when you walk into a room as there are physical objects. And it, it really raises this interesting question about what are, um, about, you know, a lot of people have this phrase where they, they, they call the physical world, the real world. And, you know, I, I kind of think increasingly, you know, the physical world is super important, but I actually think the, the real world is the combination of the physical world and the digital worlds coming together. But until this technology, they were, sort of separate, right? It's like you access the digital world through a screen, right? And, you know, maybe it's a small screen that you carry around or it's a bigger screen when you sit down at your desk and you know, strap in for a long session. But um, but they're, they're kind of fundamentally divorced and disconnected. And I think part of what this technology is going to do is bring those together into a single coherent experience of what the modern real world is, which is, and it's got to be physical because that we're physical beings. So the physical world is, is always going to be super important. But, but increasingly, I think a lot of the things that we kind of think of um, can be digital holograms. I mean, any screen that you have can be a hologram, um, you know, any media, um, you know, any book, art, um, you know, it can basically be just as effective as a hologram, as a physical object, any game um, that you're playing, a board game or, um, or any kind of physical game, cards, um, you know, ping pong, things like that. They're, they're often a lot better as holograms because you can just kind of snap your fingers and instantiate them and have them um, show up. You know, it's like you have a ping pong table show up in your living room, but then you can snap your fingers and have it be gone. Um, so that's super powerful. Um, so I think that it's, it's actually an amazing thought experiment of like how many physical things we have today that could actually be better as interactive holograms. But then beyond that, I think the the, the most important thing, obviously, is people. So the ability to you know, have these mixed hangouts, whether they're social mm. or meetings, where you, know, you show up to a conference room, you're wearing glasses um, or a headset in the very near term, but you know, hopefully by you know, over the next five years, glasses or so. And, um, and you know, you're there physically, some people are there physically, um, but other people are just there as holograms and it feels like it's them. Um, who are right there. And, and also, by the way, another thing that I think is going to be fascinating about being able to blend together the digital and physical worlds in this way is we're also going to be able to embody um, AIs as well. So I think you'll also have meetings in the future where you're basically, you know, maybe you're sitting there physically and then you have, you know, a couple of other people who are there as holograms. And then you have like Bob, the AI, who's an engineer on your team, who's helping with things. And he can now be embodied as a, um, you know, as as a, a realistic avatar as well, and just join the meeting um, in, in that way. So I think that that that's going to be pretty compelling um, as well. So then, okay, so what can you do with photorealistic avatars compared to um, kind of the more expressive ones that we have today? Well, I think a lot of this actually comes down to acceptance of the technology um, and. Because all of the stuff that we're doing, I mean, the the motion of your eyebrows, the motion of your eyes, the cheeks, and, and all of that, there's actually no reason why you couldn't do that on an expressive avatar, too. I mean, it wouldn't look exactly like you, but I mean, you can make a cartoon version of yourself and still have it be um, almost as expressive. But I, I do think that there's this bridge between the current state of, of most of our interactions in the physical world and where we're getting in the future with this kind of hybrid 
um, physical and digital world where I think it's going to be a lot easier for people to it, it kind of take some of these experiences seriously with the photorealistic avatars to start. And then I'm actually really curious to see where it goes longer term. I could see a world where people stick to the photorealistic and maybe they modify them to make them a little bit more interesting, but maybe fundamentally we like photorealistic things. Um, but I can also see a world that once people get used to the photo, the photorealistic avatars and they get used to these experiences, that I, I actually think that there could be a world where people actually prefer... Um, being able to express themselves in kind of non, uh, you know, ways that aren't so tied to their physical reality. And so I, I, that's one of the things that I'm really curious about. And I don't know, in, in a bunch of our internal experiments on this, one of the things that has, I thought was psychologically pretty interesting is people have no issues blending photorealistic stuff and not. So, you know, we could have a, you know, we, we, for this specific scene that we're in now, mm -hmm. we, we happen to sort of be in a dark room um, I, I think m part of that aesthetic decision, I think, was based on the way you like to do your podcast. But we've we've <laughs> yes. done experiences like this, um, where you have like a cartoony background, but photorealistic people who you're talking to, and we seem to like people just seem to just think that that is completely normal, right? It doesn't bother you. It doesn't feel like it's weird. Um, another thing that that we've e experienced with is. Um, is basically you have a photorealistic avatar that you're talking to, and then right next to them, you have an expressive kind of cartoon avatar. And that actually is pretty normal too, right? It's it's like, it's not that weird, right? To to basically being interacting with with different people in different modes like that. So I'm, I'm not sure. I think it'll be an interesting question to what extent these photorealistic avatars are like a, a key part of just transitioning from being comfortable in the physical world to this kind of new modern real world that that kind of includes both the digital and physical or if this is like the long-term way that it stays um that's that's a i mean i think that there are going to be uses for both the expressive and the photorealistic over time i just don't know what the balance is going to be yeah and and i mean it's also it's novel and it's also a technological feat <laughs> right it's like being able yes. to pull this off is like it's a it's like a pretty impressive and i i think to some degree it's just this kind of like awesome experience yeah um so it's, i am it's novel it's a, this I, is I just a, a an avatar that's, version of me but it's a but, but deep philosophical question yes <laughs> but i mean but here's some of the so i put this on this morning and i was like all right like it's like, okay, so this, my hair is a little shorter in this than my physical hair is right now. I probably need to go get a haircut. Sure. Um, and like, and I actually, I did happen to shave this morning, but, but if I hadn't, you know, I could still have this photorealistic avatar that is, that is more cleanly shaven, right. Even if I'm, you know, a few days in, um, physically. So I do think that they're going to start to be these subtle questions that seep in where the, the avatar is realistic, um, in, in the sense of this is kind of what you looked like at the time of capture, but it's not necessarily temporarily accurate to exactly what you look like in this moment. And I know they're going to end up being um, a bunch of questions that come from that over time that I think are going to be fascinating too. Well, I mean, I think our physical bodies also fluctuate and change over time too. So I think there's a similar question of like, which version of that are we, right? There's, there's like the, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. and, and it's interesting identity question because, all right, it's like, I don't know, it's like weight fluctuates or, or things like that. It's like, I, I think most people don't tend to think of themselves as the, uh, well, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting psychological question. Some, maybe some people, maybe a lot of people do think about themselves as the kind of worst version. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, but I think a lot of people yeah. probably think about themselves as the best version, and yeah. and I, I and then it's like what you are on a day to day basis doesn't necessarily map to, to um, to either of those. So I think that that's yeah, it, it, there will definitely be a bunch of a bunch of social scientists and and folks will have to, you know, and and psychologists are really there's going to be a lot to understand about how our perception of ourselves and others um, is shifted from this. Well, Yeah, I think that there are a lot of norms and things that people have to figure out around that. There's probably some balance where, you know, if someone is, has lost 
a loved one and is grieving, there there may be ways in which you know being able to interact or relive certain memories could be helpful. But then there's also probably an extent to which it it could become unhealthy. And I mean, I, I'm not an expert in that, so I think we'd have to study that and, and understand it in more detail. We have you know a fair amount of experience with how to handle death and identity and people's digital content through social media already, unfortunately, right? Where there, you know, there's, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, people who use our services die every day and their families, you know, often want to have access to their profiles. And we have whole protocols that we go through where, you know, there are certain parts of it that, um, that we try to memorialize. So that way the, the, family can can get access to it so that way the account doesn't just go away immediately but then there are other things that are you know important kind of private things that that person has like we're not going to give the family access to someone's messages you know for example so um so yeah I, I think that there's there's some best practices I think from the current digital world that will carry over but um but yeah I, I think that this will enable some different things another version of this is is how, is how this intersects with AIs right because and one of the the things that that we're really focused on is you know we we want there to we want the world to evolve in a way where there isn't like a single AI super intelligence, but where you know a lot of people are empowered by having AI tools to to do their jobs and you know make their lives better. And if you're a creator, right, and if you run a you know podcast like you do, then you know, you have a big community of people who are super interested to talk to you. I know you'd love to, you know, cultivate that community and you interact with them online outside of the the podcast as well. But I mean, there's way more demand both to interact with you and the, I'm sure you'd love to interact with the community more, but you just are limited by the number of hours in the day. So, you know, at some point, I think making it so that you could build um, an AI version of yourself that could interact with people, you know, not after you die, but but while you're here to help, um, you know, help help people kind of fulfill this desire to to interact with you and your desire to build a community. And there's a a lot of interesting questions around that. Um, and you know, that's obviously it's not just in in the metaverse. I think you know we we'd want to make that work, you know, across all the messaging platforms, you know, WhatsApp and Messenger and Instagram Direct. But you know, there's certainly you know a version of that where if you could have an avatar version of yourself in the metaverse that people can interact with, and you could define that sort of an AI um, version, where you know people know that they're interacting with an AI, that it's not you know the the, the kind of physical version of you, but um, maybe that AI, even if they know it's an AI, is the next best thing because they're, they're probably not going to you know necessarily all get to interact with you um, directly. I, I I think that that could be a really compelling experience. There, there's a lot of things that we need to get right about it. Um, that you know it's we're not ready to release the the version that a creator can can kind of build a version of themselves yet but we're starting to experiment with it in terms of releasing a number of AIs that people can interact with in different ways um and I, I think that that is is also just going to be a very powerful um you know set of capabilities that people have over time yeah so I mean a lot of the vision comes from this idea that, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think we necessarily want there to be like one big super intelligence. We want to empower everyone to both you know, have more fun, accomplish their business goals. You know, it, it just everything that, that that they're trying to do. And you know, we don't tend to have you know one person that we work with on everything. And I don't think in the future we're going to have you know one AI that we work with. I think you're going to want a um, a variety of these. Um, so there are a bunch of different uses. Um, you know, some will be kind of more assistant oriented. There's a sort of the kind of plain and simple one that we, that we're building is called just meta AI. It's simple. It, you, know, you can chat with it in any of your threads. Um, it doesn't have a face, right? It's, it's just, it's, um, it's just kind of more vanilla and, and neutral and, and kind of factual, um, but it can help you with a bunch of stuff. Then there are a bunch of cases that are more kind of business oriented. So let's say you want to contact a, a small business um, you know, similarly, you know, that business probably doesn't want to 
have to staff someone to man the phones and you probably don't want to wait on the phone to talk to someone, but they're you know, having someone who you can just like talk to in a natural way who can you know, help you if you're having an issue with a product or you know, if you want to make a reservation or if you want to, you want to buy something online, um, having the ability to, to do that and have a natural conversation rather than navigate some website or have to call someone and wait on hold, um, I think it's gonna be really good both for the businesses and for, for normal people who want to interact with businesses. So I think stuff like that makes sense. Um, then there are going to be a bunch of use cases that I think are just fun, right? So I think people are going to, I think that there will be AIs that like can tell jokes. So you can put them into chat thread with friends. I mean, I think a lot of this, because we're, we're like a social company, right? I mean, we're, we're you know fundamentally around helping people connect in different ways. And part of what I'm, of what I'm excited about is you know, how do you enable these kind of AIs to facilitate connection between two people or more, you know, put them in a group chat, you know, make the group chat more interesting um, around whatever your interests are, sports, fashion. Um. Well, I do think that AIs will be, will make the NPCs a lot better in games too. So that's a, a separate thing that I'm pretty excited yeah. about, but, um, but yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the AIs that we've built that just in our internal testing, people have loved the most is like a, like an adventure text-based, um, get like a dungeon master. Yeah, um, nice. and, and I, I think, um, you know, part of what, what has been fun, I mean, we, we talked about this a bit, but we, we've gotten some like real kind of cultural figures to play a bunch of these folks and be the embodiment and the avatar of them. So, um, so Snoop Dogg is the dungeon master, which I think is just hilarious. Yes. Yeah, so that AI so persona. starting off, creating new personas is easier because it doesn't need to stick exactly right. to what you know that physical person would want, how they'd want to be represented, right? It's like it's just a new character that we created. So even though this so Snoop in that case is you know he's um, you know he's basically an actor, right? He's playing the the dungeon master, but it's not Snoop Dogg, right? It's it's um, you know whoever the the dungeon master is. Um, if you want to actually make it so that you have an AI embodying a real creator, there's a whole set of things that you need to do to make sure that that AI is not going to say things that the creator doesn't want, right? And um, and that the AI is going to you know know things and be able to represent things in the way that the creator would want, um, the way that the creator would know. Um, so I think that it's less of a it's less of a question around like having the avatar express them i mean that that i think we're you know it's like well we have our kind of v1 of that that we'll release soon um as uh, after connect but you know that'll get better over time but a lot of this is really just about continuing to make the the models for these ais so that they're just more and more i don't know you could say like reliable or predictable in terms of what they'll communicate so that way you know, when you want to create the Lex um, assistant AI that that your community can talk to, um, you can, you know, it's you don't program them like normal computers. You're training them; they're AI models, not 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 um, kind of normal computer programs. But um, but you want to get it to be predictable enough so that way you can set some parameters for it. And even if it isn't perfect all the time. Um, you wanted to generally be able to stay within those bounds. So that's a lot of um, what, what I think we need to nail for, for the creators. And that's why that one's actually a much harder problem, I think, than starting with, with, uh, with new characters that you're creating from scratch. So that one, I think, will probably um, start releasing sometime next year, um, not this year, but experimenting with existing characters and the assistant and games and a bunch of different personalities and experimenting with some small businesses. Um, I, I think that that stuff will be ready to do this year and we're rolling it out, you know, basically right after Connect. Whatever, I think the but... idea of a podcast between you and AI Assistant Lex podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, a big part of how we're trying to design this these new computing products is that they should be physical, right? I think part that's a big part of the issue with computers and TVs and even phones is like, 
yeah, I mean, maybe you can interact with them in different places, but they're they're fundamentally like you're sitting, you're you're still. And I mean, people are just not meant to be that way. I mean, I think you, you and I have this shared passion for, for sports and martial arts and doing stuff like that where you're just moving around. It's like so much of what makes us people is like, you know, you, you move around. You're not, we're not just like a brain in a tank, right? It's the where, you know, the, the human experience is a physical one. And um, so it's, it's not just about having the immersive expression of the digital world. It's about being able to really natively bring that together. And, and it, it, I do really think that the, the real world is this mix of the physical and the digital, right? The digital is, there's too much digital at this point for it to just be siloed to a small screen, but the physical is too important. So you, you don't want to just sit down all day long, um, at a desk. So I, I think that this is, uh, uh, yeah, I do think that this is the future. This is, I think the kind of philosophical way that I would want the world to work in the future is a much more coherently blended physical and digital world. Well, I think, I mean, there are, there are content policies and things like that, right. In, in terms of what, what people are allowed to create, but I mean, a lot of the rules around physical, I think you try to have a society that is as free as possible, meaning that people can do as much of what they want, unless you're going to do damage to other people. And, and infringe on on their rights. And the idea of damage is somewhat different in a in a digital environment. I mean, when I get into you know uh, some world with my friends, the the first thing we start doing is shooting each other, which obviously we would not do in the physical world because you'd, you'd hurt each other. Um, but in in a game, that's like just a, it's almost you know it's like just fun and um, I mean even in like the lobby of a game, right? It's like it just it's not even bearing on the game. It's just kind of like a funny. Um, sort of humorous thing to do. So it's like, is that, is that problematic? I don't think so because it's, it's fundamentally, it's not, you're not causing harm in that world. So I think that the, um, part of the question that I think we need to figure out is what are the ways where things could have been harmful in the physical world that we will now be freed from that. And therefore there should be fewer restrictions in the digital world. Um, and then there might be new ways in which there could be harm in the digital world that there weren't the case before. So there's more anonymity, right? It's, um, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you show up to a, you know, a restaurant or something, it's like all the norms where you, you pay the bill at the end. It's because, you know, you, you, uh, you have one identity and, you know, the, you know, if you, if you stiff them, then like, you know, life is a repeat game and, and that's not going to work out well for you. But you know, in a digital world where you can be anonymous and show up in, in different ways, um, I think the incentive to act like a good citizen can be a lot less, and that causes a lot of issues and toxic behavior. So I think that, that needs to get sorted out. Um, so I think in terms of what is allowed, I think you want to just look at what 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 are the the damages. But then there's also other things that are not related to kind of harm, you know, less about what should be allowed and more about what will be possible that are more about the laws of physics, right? It's like if you wanted to travel uh, to see me in person, you'd have to get on a plane and, and that would like, you know, take a few hours to get here. Whereas, you know, we could just jump in a conference room and, you know, put on these headsets and we're basically teleported into a space where we're, you know, it feels like we're together. So that's a very novel experience that, um, that it, it breaks down some things that previously would have defy the laws of physics for what it would take to get together. And I think that that will create a lot of new opportunities Right. So um, I mean, one of the things that I'm curious about is you know, there are all these debates right now about you know, remote work or people being together. And you know, I think this gets us a lot closer to being able to work physically in different places, but actually have it feel like we're together. Um, so you know, I think that the, the dream is that is that people will one day be able to just work wherever they want, uh, but we'll have all the same opportunities because you'll be able to feel like you're physically together. I think we're not there today with with um, with just video conferencing and the basic technologies that we have. But I think part of the idea is that with something like this, over time, you could get closer to that. And that would open up a lot of opportunities, right? Because then people could live physically where they want while still being able to get the benefits of being physically or, or kind of feeling like you're together um, with people at work, all the ways that that helps to build more culture and build better relationships and build trust, um, which I think are real issues that if, you, if you're not seeing people you know, in, in, in person ever. So yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be, it's very hard from first principles to think about all the implications of, um, of, of a technology like this. And, 
you know, all the good and, and, and the things that you need to mitigate. So you, know, you try to do your best to, to kind of envision what things are going to be like and accentuate the things that they're going to be awesome and hopefully mitigate some of the, the, the downside things. But I, you know, it's the reality is that we're going to be building this out one year at a time. It's going to take a while. Um, so we're going to just get to see how, how, how it evolves and, and what developers and, and different folks do with it. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think on, on the last podcast that we did together, we were talking about the debate that we were having around open sourcing Llama 2. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we did. Um, you know, I think at this point, you know, there's the, the value of open sourcing a foundation model like Llama 2 is significantly greater than, um, than, the, than the risks. And in, in my view, I mean, we did, we spent a lot of time doing a very rigorous assessment of that and red teaming it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that we released Llama 2. I think the reception has been, um, it's, it's just been really exciting to see how excited people have, have been uh, about it. And it's gotten way more you know, downloads and usage than, I, than I, I would have even expected. And I was pretty optimistic about it. Um, so that's, that's been great. Um, Llama 3, uh, I mean there's always another model that we're training. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, for right now, you know, we built, we, we train Llama 2 and we released it as an open source model. And right now the priority is building that into a bunch of the consumer products, all the different AIs and, um, and, and a bunch of different um, products that, that we're basically building as consumer products. Because Llama 2 by itself, it's not a consumer product, right? It's more of a piece of infrastructure that people could, could build things with. So that's been the big priority is kind of continuing to fine tune and, um, and, and kind of just get Llama 2 and, and it's, um, and it's little, the branches that we built off of it ready for consumer products that hopefully, you know, hundreds of millions of people will, will, um, enjoy using those, those products in billions one day. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're also working on, on the future foundation models and, um, and I don't have anything you know, new or news, news on that. I don't know. And I don't know exactly when it's going to be ready. Um, I think just like we had a debate around Llama 2 and open sourcing it. Um, I think we'll, we'll need to have a similar debate and process to red team this and make sure that this is safe. But, and my hope is that we'll be able to, to open source this next version when it's ready too. But, um, but that's not that we're, we're not, we're not, you know, close to doing that this month. I mean, this is, um, that's just, it's a thing that we're, we're still somewhat early in working on. Yeah. I mean, part of what we're trying to do with the initial AI's launch is, um, having a diversity of different use cases just so that people can try different things. Cause I don't know what's going to work. I mean, are, are people going to like playing in you know, the text-based adventure games or are they going to, you know, like having, a comedian who who can add jokes um, to to threads, or they can want to interact with historical figures. Um, you know, we made we made one of Jane Austen and and one of uh, Marcus Aurelius, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to see how that goes. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, that's why. Well, so we're starting out with a set, and then um, we're also working on this platform that we call AI Studio. That's going to make it so that you know, over time, anyone will be able to create you know, one of these AIs almost like they create any other UGC content across the platform. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think that to some degree, we're not going to see the full potential of this until you just have the full creativity of the whole community being able to build stuff. But there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that we need to get right. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited to take this in stages. I don't, I don't think anyone out there is really doing what we're doing here. I think that there are, mm -hmm. there are people who are, who are doing kind of like fictional or consumer oriented character type stuff, but the extent to which we're building it out with the, um, you know, avatars and, and expressiveness and, and making it so that they can interact across, um, you know, all of the different apps and, um, they'll, they'll have profiles and, you know, we'll be able to engage people on Instagram and Facebook. I, I, I think it's, it's just, it's, um, it's going to be really fun. Well, I mean, this is a lot of the thesis behind the whole 
metaverse is giving people the ability to feel like you're present with someone. I mean, this is like the main thing I talk about all the time, but I, I do think that there's a lot to, to process about it. I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I, I'm definitely here. We're just not, we're, we're not physically in the same place. It's not like you're, you yeah. know, you're not talking to an AI, right? You're, you know, this is, um, so I, I think the the thing that's novel is the ability to convey through technology, a sense of almost physical presence. Um, so the the thing that is not physically real is um, is us being in the same physical place, but uh, but but kind of everything else is, and I think that that gets to this somewhat philosophical question about what is the nature of kind of the modern real world, and I, I just think that that's it, it. Really, is this combination of a physical world and the presence that we feel but also being able to combine that with this increasingly rich and powerful and capable digital world that we have and, and, and all of the, the innovation that's getting created there. So um, I, I think it's super exciting because, I mean, the, the digital world is just, is just increasing um, in, in its capability and our ability to do awesome things, but the physical world is so profound, and that's a lot of what makes us human is, is that we're, we're, we're physical beings. So I don't think we want to run away from that and just spend all day on a screen. And that's like, you know, it's one of the reasons why I care so much about, about helping to shape and accelerate the, these future computing platforms. I just think this is so powerful. And it's, it's, you know, even though the current version of this is like, you're wearing a headset. Um, I I just think this is going to be by far the most human and social computing platform that has ever existed. And I know that that's what, what makes me excited. But there are a lot of social and psychological things that go along with that experience that was previously only physical presence, right? I think that there's like an intimacy, a trust, um, you know, there's a, a level of communication because so much of communication is nonverbal and is based on mm-hmm. expressions that you're kind of, you know, you're, you're sharing with, with someone when you're in this kind of environment. And before those things would have only been possible, you know, had you know, I gotten on a plane and and flown to Austin and and sat you know physically with you in the same place. So mm-hmm. I, I think we're we're basically shortcutting those laws of physics and delivering the social and psychological benefits of being able to be present and and feel like you're there with another person, which I think are real benefits um, to anyone in the world. And I, I think that that, like you said, I mean, I think that is going to be a very profound thing, um, and that a lot of that is. You know, that's the promise of of the metaverse and what you know why you know i i just well i think that that's the next frontier for for what we're working on you know i started working on social networks when they were primarily text where the first version of facebook your profile you know you had one photo and the rest of it was like lists of things that you were interested in and and then we kind of went through the period where we were doing photos and you know now we're kind of in the period where most of the content is video but there's a clear trend where you know, over time, the way that we want to express ourselves and and kind of get insight and content about the world around us gets increasingly just richer and more vivid. And I, I think the ability to be immersed and feel present with the people around you or the people who you care about is, from my perspective, clearly the next frontier. It just so happens that it's incredibly technologically difficult, right? It requires building up these new computing platforms and completely new software stacks to deliver that. But I mean, I kind of feel like that's what we're here to do as a company. This is the Lex Free Podcast.